the mind needs time to be by itself, to straighten out its issues inside. Which is why we have a place like this, a place of physical seclusion. So you don't have to spend all your time looking at other people's issues. You've just got your own issues. Then you have a chance to dig down inside and see where they come from, what can be done about them. So you want to value and protect your time here to make sure that it is a time of seclusion as much as possible. But there's the rub. We are social animals. Even here at the, at the monastery, we have to live with one another. And a lot of us have to go back out outside of the monastery, where we deal with other people, with other, other views, other ideas, other ways of practicing. And we have to learn how to practice with that as well. It's not easy. As the Buddha said, for a group of people to live together in harmony requires six things. The first three have to do with goodwill for one another. In other words, when you act, you act with goodwill. When you speak, you speak with goodwill. When you even think about one another, you think with goodwill. As for the other three qualities, one is generosity. You share what you gain. You're generous, not only with material things, but also you're generous with your knowledge, you're generous with your help, generous with your forgiveness. The next quality is that you have your views are in common. Your idea of what's right and wrong is something that you all hold in common. And then the, finally, that your virtues are things that you hold in common. You all hold to the same standard of virtue. It's these last two qualities where it gets difficult, especially when you're living out in the world. Well, people are not practicing the Dharma, not interested in the Dharma. They've got totally other ideas, total different agendas. And so the issue is, how do you deal with people whose views don't coincide with yours and whose idea of right and wrong doesn't coincide with yours? One possible solution is to give up your ideas of right and wrong, but that doesn't work. You don't feel right inside when you do that. In communities where they say, we'll have no right and wrong here, everything's going to be non-dual, they don't work. They're very dysfunctional, because right and wrong get shifted around, i.e., people who do what they want, and then anybody who complains, they're the ones who are wrong, they're the ones who are clinging, they're the ones who are holding on, i.e., they're wrong. So there's still right and wrong in there, but it's, it's a strange standard for right and wrong. It allows people to be harmed. And you look at the Buddha. The Buddha had a very strong sense of right and wrong. If he didn't have a strong sense of right and wrong, he wouldn't have set forth the vinya. He wouldn't have established the precepts. He wouldn't have pointed out that there are lots of views out there that are dead wrong, cause people to suffer, keep people in the round of rebirth, prevent them from finding any release. And he's very clear about that. And when any of the monks or nuns misbehaved, he was very strong in his criticism. So you don't abandon your idea of right and wrong. You simply try to figure out how do you live with other people so that you can get, to, get them to see a little bit of 
what you may very rightly see as right and wrong. That's where those other qualities come in. Goodwill, generosity. You've got to have goodwill for people no matter how wrong they might be. You have to be generous with people no matter how wrong they might be. Because otherwise their behavior starts becoming your behavior. And you find yourself clashing and you get, get into despair. You wonder if there's ever any way that you can come to any kind of peace. And on the one hand, you have to realize that you know, the work of the world is never done. There are always going to be issues that are unresolved. So you don't want to bang your head against things that cannot be changed. But you do want to work on what can be changed. You have to keep working at it. You can't let yourself give up. There's a story of a Zen student, I think it was in Minnesota, who was going to come out here to Los Angeles, try his luck at the entertainment industry. He went to say goodbye to his teacher, and his teacher said, well, suppose you get out there and your first job is a failure. What are you going to do? The guy said, well, I guess I'll just have to accept that. And he just said, no, you don't accept that kind of thing. You bounce back. Try again. If you get knocked down again, you try again. can't let yourself give in to despair. You have to be able to bounce back. And you have to have confidence there is some way that this is going to work out. This is why conviction is one of the basic qualities we have to have in the path. It's like someone who's lost in the forest. If you're convinced that there's no way out, there will be no way out, at least for you. If you're convinced that there's a way out, then when there is a way out, you'll find it. Keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. You have to have that kind of confidence in your sense of what's right and wrong. As for the distinction between the things that you can change and the things that you can't, it's by bouncing against the things that you can't change enough times. You begin to recognize them. So you have to take those bounces as learning, learning bumps. But the principle of not giving up is very important. This is why in the old days they didn't make it easy for people to come and practice the Dharma. In the Zen monasteries you had to sit outside the door for 24 hours to prove your sincerity. Back in the early days when John Mun was wandering around to Chiang Mai, if you wanted to find him, you had to go out into the forest and look for him. He wasn't sending out bulletins. He didn't have a website. He didn't keep people informed about where he was. You had to be sincere and persistent. feeling being that if you'd showed that sincerity and that persistence, okay, then you'd be a, a good candidate to learn the Dharma. And this is a lesson that gets taught from an early age. In Japan they have a little doll that when you knock it over, it writes itself. You knock it over again and it turns, gets right up again. And they use this to teach children. The child falls down and starts crying. The grandmother will toss the little doll at, at the child, and the doll will tip over, and then it will get straight back up again. The lesson being, try to make yourself like that doll. No matter how many times you get knocked down, you get right back up again. You keep fighting, because it is a frequent image in the canon. That to be practicing the Dharma, you have to fight. You get knocked down, and this is part of fighting. It's not that you're going to be totally victorious every time and come out winning. You have to learn from your hard knocks with the confidence, okay, these are lessons. 
But you also have to have confidence in the Dharma itself, that this is a good way to live. You need this for your heart. And that's what has to come first. If you simply go along with the ways of the world just to go along, you don't really feel connected, even if it's for a sake of feeling connected to having friends, but it's a kind of friendship where you feel even more lonely when you're surrounded by people. When you know in your heart that okay, you are suffering and you need to work on the cause of suffering and it's not going to come by hanging around with friends. It's going to come by digging down into your own mind and following the path. You have to take that as your first priority. Then your relationships with other people, those come second. You look for relationships that are helpful and conducive on the path. But you realize that there are some relationships you have that you cannot yet disentangle yourself from, and yet they're not helpful on the path. At least the person is not a person of right view or right, right virtue. So you've got to figure out how to use your powers of goodwill, your powers of generosity. Use your concentration to develop ingenuity in how to make virtue attractive to that person, how to make right view, at least a little bit of it, attractive to that person. You're acting out of goodwill. You're trying to be generous. Because simply being right is not enough. You see this in the Vinaya. If, you see, if one monk sees that another monk has been misbehaving, he can't go up, just go up and tell him off. He's got to look for the right time, the right place, and also make sure that his intentions toward that person are kind. In other words, you're not doing this just to prove your one-upsmanship or to knock the other person down. It's for the sake of rehabilitating the person. And you have to look at your intention to make sure that you're speaking out of goodwill, acting out of goodwill. Now, it may take some time to do that, to get your mind in order, get your heart in order, so you can speak to that person. I know of one monk who's talked about an issue he had with another monk. It was five years before he could finally talk with him. But after that fifth year, he'd finally gotten around to the point where he actually could have some goodwill for the other monk. And so the issue was resolved easily. So you've got to adjust your attitude, even when you're right. It's, it, you know, it's hard to be right in a land of wrong view and long, wrong virtue. Even in the monkhood, it's not always easy to be right. But you have to be skillful in being right so that you don't suffer from it and so that you don't also compromise your principles. There's a skill here in learning how to get other people to at least see a little bit in line with right view and act at least a little bit in line with right speech and right action. How do you make it attractive to them? How do you make them see that it's worth their while, that it's for their own good, to think and act in these ways? Knowing whether some people you'll be able to do it, other people will just be totally closed-minded. But as long as you're coming with a sense of goodwill and try to use your ingenuity, learning to be more diplomatic, learning to be more well, less confrontational. But trying to figure out how to get through to that other person, and this has to come from a mind of goodwill and sympathy. That's the only way you're going to get through. Because after all, these people are deluded. You have to feel sorry for them. The Buddha talks about when you feel hatred for someone, and try to look for their 
they're good qualities. And if you find them, you focus on them. Like a monk who's looking for robe material. He wants to make robe from thrown away scraps, and he finds a piece of scrap scrap cloth, and part of it's dirty and filthy, can't be used. And so he learns how to cut it off and just take the good part. In the same way, you try to look at the good side of those other people. Focus on that. It gives you a sense of wanting to help them, to see at least they have some seed of something. That's worth cultivating. As for the people who have no good at all, and there are such people, the Buddha doesn't deny it. People have been horrible in their speech, horrible in their actions, horrible in their thinking. You just kind of feel sorry for them. He said it's like seeing someone out in the middle of a desert by the side of the road, sick, unable to care for himself. Regardless of who he is, you've got to feel compassion for him. Otherwise, a person who's horrible in every way is creating a lot of bad karma for him or herself. And you've got to feel sorry for that person. If you can't help that person immediately, you express the wish, well, maybe someday, let's hope someday this person comes to his senses, comes to her senses. learns how to see what's right and wrong. So there's a skill to being right. It's not just enough that you're right. You have to be right in a skillful way. In the same way that your intentions can't just be good intentions, they have to be skillful intentions. So you want to take that as a challenge. You want to be up for the challenge, convincing yourself that there's a worthwhile skill to be learned here, and you can do it. It may take time. You may find that it comes easy, you may find that it comes hard. As we mentioned today, this is one of the drawbacks of our educational system, that it doesn't teach people how to become good at things for which they have little aptitude. It takes certain qualities of mind, a certain type of confidence that's blended with humility, the humility that, okay, I'm not really good at this yet, but I can learn. I may not be the best whatever. At least I can learn how to do a passable job. When you develop that kind of attitude, you find that it's also really helpful in your meditation. In the days when it's difficult for the mind to get settled down, you say, okay, here's a problem. Here's a puzzle. Let's see if we can figure it out. It's in this way that practicing with difficulties outside can be very useful in practicing with difficulties in your meditation. So when we talk about taking daily life as practice, it's not just it's not just words. You actually are learning something. You're trying to use your powers of ingenuity with other people's defilements so that you can get more ingenious in dealing with your own. You have to learn how to think strategically. It's amazing how cunning people can be when they're doing something that's, that's really wrong. It's, good, it, it's a shame that we can't be more cunning in how we do things rightly. But maybe we can. And it's worth the try. That way our being right is right all around, and not just a form of clinging. You're being right with discernment, and discernment, as we all know in the Buddhist teachings, is strategic. Realizing that even though Things may seem very straightforward in the text. In actual practice, you have to learn how to think strategically, to deal with obstacles that come up. And find your way around them. That's how discernment becomes your own, a quality that's in your mind and not just there in the texts. It 
may not be easy, but it's worth the try. Nobody ever promised it was going to be easy. But the Buddha did promise that this is the true way to happiness. So it's worth our while to take him at his word. <laughs>